There is no aircraft in history that matches the relevance and versatility of the Lockheed C-130 Hercules. In continuous production longer than any other military aircraft, the C-130 has earned a reputation as a workhorse ready for any mission. Conceived in the depths of the Cold War, the Hercules has hauled troops, vehicles, cargo, and refugees in several major wars, numerous interventions, and countless relief and humanitarian missions. There have also been a dizzying array of special purpose models, filling such diverse roles such as airborne early warning, weather reconnaissance, side firing gunship, electronic and photographic intelligence, arctic resupply, research and rescue, and aerial refueling tanker. The genesis of the C-130 program dates back to the 1940s. World War II saw the first extensive use of tactical airlift, and by the end of the war the concept of moving troops into battlefield areas by air had been proven. Successful use was made of gliders for transporting vehicles and heavy equipment during airborne operations. However, the advantages of a powered aircraft that could land, discharge its cargo, and take off again under its own power were obvious. The Korean War showed that World War II-era piston engine transport such as the Fairchild C-119 flying boxcar, Douglas C-47 Skytrains, and Curtis C-46 Commandos were no longer adequate. On February 2, 1951, the Tactical Air Force Command issued a request for proposals to Boeing, Douglas, Fairchild, and Lockheed aircraft companies calling for a medium-weight turboprop-powered transport capable of meeting any specifications and performance criteria outlined in any of the three general operational requirements it included. The particular GOR which Lockheed elected to respond called for the aircraft to accommodate four typical missions, referred to as airhead, resupply, logistical support, and troop carrier. The Airhead mission required the aircraft to carry a 25,000-pound payload to ground forces holding a position in enemy territory while retaining a combat radius of 1,100 nautical miles without refueling. The Resupply mission required the aircraft to carry 37,800 pounds of cargo over a distance of 950 nautical miles and back without refueling. The logistical support mission required a range of 1,700 nautical miles while carrying a 37,800 pounds cargo. In the troop carrier configuration, the aircraft would be required to accommodate 64 paratroopers or 92 ground personnel. Lockheed was seemingly the underdog in the competition, but its Model 82, created by designers of the company's Skunk Works division at Burbanks, California, was extremely well thought out, with a configuration that would set the standard for airlifters. As the Model 82 configuration matured, so grew the preliminary design group's conviction it was creating a logical yet utilitarian aircraft capable not only of achieving, but superseding the basic GOR objectives which specified payload range requirements eight times that of any then existent design. The resulting transport cargo bay was 41 feet long, 10 feet, 3 inches wide, and as low as 9 feet high and only 3.5 inches above the ground level, due in part to mounting the high lift wing high on the fuselage. Straightened loading was accomplished via a rear two-piece cargo door, whose forward segment was hinged at its forward end and designed to swing down to a maximum of 13 degrees and thus serve as an entry or exit ramp. The smaller rear segment was hinged at its aft end and designed to swing up to the aft fuselage, thus providing increased clearance for cargo loading and unloading. In consideration of the rough field requirement in the GOR, Gene Frost, Deputy Director of the Preliminary Design, spent a considerable amount of time agonizing over the design of the landing gear. In the end, the high wing configuration dictated an encapsulated gear assembly attached to the fuselage side and fared in pods. This proved an engineering windfall, as it simplified the retraction mechanisms, left the cargo hold unaffected volumetrically, and had little impact on the aircraft's drag. The tandem wheel assemblies, equipped with high flotation tires, attracted vertically into the pod and thus eliminated any geometrically complex strut assemblies. Consequently, it became possible to build a strong landing gear while keeping weight to a minimum. The advent of efficient turboprop engines, in particular Allison's by now extremely dependable 3750 equivalent shaft horsepower T56A1 provided major windfall for the Model 82. The related decision to equip the aircraft with four instead of two engines permitted improved safety, allowed for significant increase in gross weight and payload weight, and eased the task of meeting speed, climb, and range requirements. Additionally, pressurization of the entire fuselage, at the time somewhat of a novelty, became an achievable goal due to the excess power available. In addition to the conventional materials and processes, a number of new ones were utilized in the new Lockheed Transport in order to obtain increased performance and serviceability. 
The Model 82 also became one of the first aircraft to benefit from the use of a new aluminum alloy. Most usage was in the form of plate extrusions for primary structure, particularly stiffened skins. The proposals, upon completion, were submitted to the Air Force during April of 1951. Lockheed's aircraft weighed 57,500 pounds empty and had an all-up weight of 108,000 pounds, including a 25,000 pound payload. Predicted performance of the aircraft exceeded the requirements in almost every important part of the envelope. Because of Korean War pressures, the Boeing, Douglas, Fairchild, and Lockheed proposals were quickly evaluated by the Air Force. On July 2nd, five months after first receiving the RFP, Lockheed was informed its proposal had been picked for prototyping over those of the competition. On July 11, 1951, it was announced that the Model 82 would be bought by the USAF, with the military designation C-130. In short order, the company officially named the new transport Hercules, in concert with its tradition of naming aircraft after the stars and constellations. The first flight of the YC-130 prototype was made on the 23rd of August 1954 at 2.45 p.m. from Lockheed Plant in Burbank, California. The aircraft was second prototype, but the first to fly of two. The YC-130 was piloted by Stanley Belts and Roy Wimmer on its 61-minute flight to Edwards Air Force Base. Jack Reel and Dick Stanton served as flight engineers. Kelly Johnson flew chase in a Lockheed P-2V Neptune. The number one YC-130 took off on January 21st, 1955. Having served as a static test article while the number two aircraft would be used to accomplish the initial flight test tasks. As predicted, early flight test work with the two Roman-nosed aircraft proved very encouraging. Pilots reported good handling characteristics and considerably better than expected performance. Due in part to the fact that the basic mission weight of 108,000 pounds had been 5,000 pounds lighter than guaranteed, cruising speed was some 20% higher, takeoff distances were some 25% lower, ceiling and initial climb rates were some 35% higher, landing distances were some 40% shorter, and single engine out climb rates were a stunning 55% higher than predicted. These figures, coupled with other obvious attributes of what was rapidly becoming widely admired as a most remarkable aircraft, gave the Air Force confidence in its decision to support the program had been a good one. Remarkably, the service had committed to an initial buy of seven C-130As, approximately a year and a half prior to the aircraft's first flight. Predating the latter event, the Air Force had requested Lockheed to reopen an Air Force-owned manufacturing facility in Marietta, Georgia, in order to meet an expected Korean War fan increase in aircraft production capacity. Initially, it was proposed this facility, which had been built for Bell Aircraft Corporation during World War II, which had initially been used to manufacture Bell-built models of Boeing B-29, would be utilized to refurbish a large fleet of B-29s, then in storage at Peyote B, some 40 miles west of Odessa, Texas. Following the success of this operation, and then the follow-on production of some 394 Boeing B-47 Stratojets, Lockheed announced, during October of 1952, its decision to shift the production of C-130 to this facility under the direction of Al Brown. Brown moved temporarily from Marietta to Burbank and along with a team of Marietta engineers, worked side-by-side -side with their Burbank associates as the prototype aircraft were assembled. After the two prototypes were completed, production began in Marietta, Georgia on March 10, 1955, where over 2,300 C-130s have been built through 2009. By the summer of 1955, the two prototype YC-130s had been joined by three production examples and flight test work at Edwards AFB was progressing rapidly. The initial production model, the C-130A, was powered by Allison T56A9 turboprops with three-bladed propellers and originally equipped with the blunt nose of the prototypes. The first production batch of C-130A aircraft entered service with the U.S. Air Force in December 1956. C-130A production amounted to 231 aircraft. The only export customer for new-built machines being the Royal Australian Air Force, which bought 12 powered by T-56A11 engines. These have since been retired, with some examples being passed on to Chad. The C-130A was superseded on the line by the B model, which first flew on November 20, 1958. The C-130B model was developed to complement the A models that had previously been delivered, and incorporated new features, particularly increased fuel capacity in the form of auxiliary tanks built into the center wing section and an AC electrical system. Four-bladed Hamilton standard propellers replaced the Aero Products three-bladed propellers that distinguished the earlier A models. 
Whereas the C-130A and B models were bought primarily for tactical transport of troops and logistical support of TAC combat wings, the next Hercules variant would take one new role, that of a limited strategic airlifter. By the early 1960s, the Military Air Transport Service was faced with large fleet of slow and outmodeled propeller-driven transports that could not beat the command's need for fast intercontinental airlift. To remedy this, the extended range C-130E model entered service in 1962. The C-130E could carry an additional 2,720 gallons of fuel in large external tanks outboard of the engines, giving the Hercules sufficient range to reach what was then West Germany non-stop, a critical capability for NATO missions. Even the vast Pacific could be crossed with a single stop in Hawaii, which would prove vital during the Vietnam years. The first C-130E flew on August 25, 1961, and a total of 389 examples were produced for MATS and TAC. The line was once again improved with the arrival of the C-130H of 1965. These included yet more powerful Allison T-56A-15 turboprop engines and eventually saw the avionics sweep modernized and the structure further reinforced for extended service lives. Although the Hercules has been involved in combat operations worldwide, it was the US involvement in Southeast Asia from 1960 to 1975 that helped cement the type's reputation. In 1964, C-130 crews from the 6,315th Operations Group at Naha Air Base, Okinawa, commenced forward air control missions over the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos, supporting USAF strike aircraft. In April 1965, the mission was expanded to North Vietnam, where C-130 crews led formations of Martin B-57 Canberra bombers on night reconnaissance and strike missions against communist supply routes leading to South Vietnam. In a war of mobility, the capabilities of Hercules were pivotal in quickly moving men and material through a country-wide war zone. In the assault role, the Hercules was almost as versatile as the Air Mobile, since the hundred rudimentary landing strips capable of accommodating C-130s rarely proved an obstacle to the aircraft's excellent short field performance. Not all Hercules missions in Vietnam involved conventional or assault landings to unload the aircraft on the ground. Frequently, C-130s parachuted their loads or made use of special delivery techniques. There was a ground proximity extraction system, in which the loads were pulled out of the aft loading ramp as the aircraft flew a few feet above the ground, by means of a trailing hook which would be engaged with a cable set up by troops in the field. There was also the low altitude parachute extraction system, in which palletized and shockproof loads equipped with large parachutes were simply sucked out from the open hold while the aircraft was flying a few feet above the ground, permitting very large items such as tanks and other armored vehicles to be deposited to units in the actual combat zone. The low altitude extraction system were particularly useful to resupply Marines in Khe Sanh, South Vietnam, when isolated United States Marine Corps' outpost became too dangerous to land due to hostile ground fire and shelling. The only major U.S. combat parachute assault of the war took place when the U.S. Army launched Operation Junction City in February 1967, attempting to destroy the central office for South Vietnam. Part of this operation was the first large-scale airborne attack combat drop since Korea, with C-130s dropping paratroopers from the 173rd Airborne Brigade north of Tay Ninh City on February 22nd. A total of 13 C-130s dropped nearly 800 combat troops while another eight aircraft dropped supporting equipment, returning in the early afternoon to carry out further cargo drops. Five C-130s were hit, but they suffered no serious damage. The next day, 38 Hercules flew resupply sorties, and these continued for the next five days, during which daily drops averaged 100 tons. By late March, during the final stages of the operation, the C-130s carried out airdrops to a floating brigade, using drop zone locations which the ground unit provide by radio. By the time Junction City finished, some 1,700 tons of supplies and munitions had been airdropped by the Hercules. Although other airborne operations would be conducted during the war, Junction City Alternate would be the only exercise of such size, as most air mobile missions centered around the use of helicopters. As the war progressed, C-130s were modified into MC-130 combat talons, which not only picked up special operations forces in hostile territories, but acted as flying gas tankers, orbiting the sky as American rescue helicopters docked with them to refuel. The Hercules also played an active combatant role in the Vietnam fighting. One of the most notable uses of the C-130 in Vietnam was its role as a BLU-82 bomber. Starting in 1969, C-130Bs of the 463rd were tasked with the Commando Vault missions, 
these being strikes with M121 10,000 pound bombs, later replaced by new 15,000 BLU-82B weapons. The BLU-82 was a massive bomb, equivalent in weight to 20,000 pounds of TNT, that was dropped from C-130s in order to clear landing zones and destroy enemy positions. Although the BLU-82 was only used a handful of times, it was a highly effective weapon that helped to clear the way for ground forces. Perhaps the most famous variant of the C-130 is the AC-130 gunship, which is equipped with a wide range of weapon systems including 7.8-inch Gatling guns, 1.5-inch cannons, and later, a side-firing 4-inch howitzer. The AC-130 was deployed to Vietnam in 1968, where it was used to provide fire support to ground troops and engage enemy forces. The idea of an aircraft with heavy gun armament for ground attack dates back to the First World War, and the US made extensive use of the B-25 and A-26 gunships in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Although effective, forward-firing guns could only keep their weapons on target during the run-in. An aircraft with side-firing weapons could be able to make pylon turns around a target, thus always keeping its guns pointed in the right direction. In 1967, JC-130A serial number 54-1626 was converted to prototype AC-130A under Project Gunship 2. New equipment included a night vision telescope installed in the forward door and an early forward-looking infrared device mounted in the left wheel well. The miniguns were fixed facing down and aft along the left side. In September 1967, the AC-130, called Sign Spectre, was flown to Nha Trang Air Base in South Vietnam for a 90-day test program. It was an immediate success and in 1968, seven more airplanes were converted to the same configuration. The AC-130 was later supplemented by the AC-119 Shadow of Project Gunship 3, which later proved to be underpowered. On the 28th of January 1973, the Vietnam Peace Accord went into effect, making the end of Spectre operations in Vietnam. On the 22nd of February 1973, American offensive operations in Laos ended and the gunships became totally committed to operations in the Cambodian conflict. With the conclusion of hostiles in Southeast Asia in the mid-1970s, the AC-130H became the sole gunship in the regular Air Force, while the AC-130A fleet was transferred to the Air Force Reserve's 919th Tactical Airlift Group. AC-130s from both the 4th and the 16th Special Operations Squadrons have been deployed in nearly every conflict which the United States has been involved, officially and unofficially, since the end of the Vietnam War. A pair of AC-130As were already in Panama when the December 1989 invasion took place and took part in the operation covering the transports landing at Howard Air Force Base, as well as operating against Noriega's Panama Defense Forces during the Gulf War of 1990-91. Regular Air Force and Air Force Reserve AC-130s provided close air support and force protection for ground forces and battlefield interdiction. The primary interdiction targets were early warning slash ground control intercept sites along the southern border of Iraq. The first gunship to enter the Battle of Kafchi helped stop a southern-bound Iraqi armored column on the 29th of January 1991. One day later, three more gunships provided further aid to Marines participating in the operation. The gunships attacked Iraqi positions in columns moving south to reinforce their positions north of the city. The military had used the AC-130 gunships during the humanitarian operations in Somalia in 1992-93. Along with that was also Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti in 1994. As late as September 1994, the AC-130As were still combat ready and were standing by to provide cover for the US invasion of Haiti. Despite the peaceful departure of the junta led by General Sedras and the subsequent cancellation of the invasion, the gunships still flew over Haiti as the occupation began, providing cover for convoys, surveying transportation routes, and deterring any possible hostile acts by the Haitian military. By the mid-1990s, the original gunships had reached the end of their lives. Now four decades old, they were becoming steadily harder to support, and the arrival of the new AC-130Us meant that they could finally be retired. In subsequent conflicts, including the Iraqi War and War in Afghanistan, the AC-130 has continued to play a critical role in supporting ground forces and engaging enemy targets. AC-130 strikes were directed by special forces on known Taliban locations during the early days of the war in Afghanistan. The C-130 continues to be the world standard for tactical airlift needs, especially in the form of the C-130J Super Hercules. The Super Hercules offers superior performance and new capabilities, with the range and flexibility for every theater of operations and evolving requirements. To date, 
16 countries operate the C-130J, which has been used to set 54 world aviation records. The C-130J family includes 11 variants, and it can support more than 16 different mission requirements. For example, the C-130J Super Hercules is the airplane of choice for the Air Force Reserve Command's Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, known as the Hurricane Hunters. They fly their WC-130Js straight into the eye of hurricanes, traveling from the outskirts of the storm to its center and then out again, making repeated trips to measure wind speed and barometric pressure. The results offer critical predictive data about the sensitivity and direction of tropical storms, increasing the accuracy of National Hurricane Center's forecasts by 30%. Moreover, the Hercules has been used to help during humanitarian crises. The people of the Congo, Somalia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Kosovo, Japan, and all other points around the world, including New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, have all benefited from the C-130's unparalleled delivery and airdrop capabilities, whether they were acting as a flying hospital or delivering hay to cows marooned by a snowstorm. In January 2010, C-130s helped haul more than 13,600 short tons of cargo, transporting more than 25,800 passengers in routing 280 patients for medical evaluations from Haiti after the country's devastating earthquake. During fire season in the United States, eight specially equipped C-130s are put through their paces by crews with little margin for error. Flying over rugged mountainous terrain, often through deadly plumes of black smoke, the C-130s must slow down to 120 knots, zoom in over targeted hotspots, and drop fire retardant before quickly pulling up to avoid oncoming ridges. It is essential to firefighting efforts, as the mixture of water and fertilizer coats the foliage to slow the rate of burn, thus buying precious time for the firefighters on the ground to contain its spread. The C-130 is equally adept on snow and ice. Equipped with skis and Teflon-coated runners, the durable aircraft has earned great respect for safely delivering supplies deep into Antarctica or the Greenland ice cap. The C-130 Hercules is one of the most iconic aircraft in military history, renowned for its ruggedness, versatility, and adaptability. From its origins in the 1950s to its use in conflicts around the world, the C-130 has played a critical role in military transport and logistics operations. With its formidable range, payload capacity, and flexibility, the C-130 will likely remain a mainstay of military aviation for many years to come. A new model troop and cargo plane was completed and put under flight testing for the U.S. Air Force in 1955. It was the C-130 Hercules, a medium-weight prop jet transport built by the Georgia Division of Lockheed Aircraft Corporation to speed men, cargo, and equipment to America's defense outposts. Construction of this aircraft was well underway when the year 1955 began. Six production model C-130s were already under construction in January. At that time, the first plane, serial number 3001, occupied position two on the production line. The aircraft soon was moved to the final assembly position. A check was made to see that the actual weight of the engine, an Allison T-56, met specifications before installing it on the plane. In the meantime, Curtis Wright propellers were uncrated, reversible blades were fitted into the hubs, and operation of the blade change mechanism was checked. 
A preservative was added to the engine fuel system until actual engine runs could be accomplished on the flight lines. The engines were turned by air ground power for the pickling process. All engines were installed by mid-February. Before the plane left the production line, installations of personnel seats and equipment were checked and found to be satisfactory. The seats were removed and special first flight test equipment was installed. The first aircraft was then moved to the engineering flight test department for flutter and vibration tests. By late March, fueling operations and tests had been completed on all engines. High-speed taxi runs were made to check the operation of different systems and equipment preparatory to flight. The first production C-130 took off on its maiden flight on April 7, 1955. Only about 800 feet of runway were required for the takeoff. The plane was in the air one hour and seven minutes. During this flight, landing gear and stall tests were satisfactory. Starting with this trip, a half dozen C-130s logged a total of 94 hours and 17 minutes in tests during the remainder of the year. The landing on the first flight was routine. Using reversible propellers, the plane required only about 2,000 feet of runway for the landing. On a landing a few days later, however, a fire developed resulting from the failure of a fuel quick disconnect behind engine number two firewall. After the aircraft was repaired, more test flights were conducted. While number 3001 went through production, pre-flight and engineering flight testing, static tests were being performed on airplane number 3002. The second aircraft had been designated as a static test article a guinea pig for experimental purposes in the C-130 program. The fuselage of the static test article was prepared for an air pressure test. It was filled with containers to protect against serious damage should the section fail. The aft section failed at 12.74 pounds per square inch. To reduce potential damage resulting from pressure tests, Lockheed proposed that further tests be conducted hydrostatically. The Air Force concurred. A concrete pool was built for the hydrostatic or underwater tests of the aft and nose sections. The pool cost approximately $20,000, and the water method has saved an estimated half million dollars. The water testing procedure was simple. The fuselage section was bulkheaded, made watertight, filled with water, and submerged. The interior was pressurized. With the conventional air pressure test method, when failure occurs, the force of the exploding compressed air causes secondary damage, which sometimes makes it difficult to find the origin of the weakness. Damage to the section is less in the hydrostatic test, since water, for all practical purposes, is not compressible. The forward section was pressurized satisfactorily. The aft section, which failed in the air pressure tests, was replaced and submerged in the pool. The section was successfully pressurized to 15.1 pounds per square inch, more than twice the normal operating pressure. Due to the uniformity of the center fuselage section, and as a result of some previous testing at the California Division, it was considered safe to test this section with air. The section was pressurized to the required 15 pounds per square inch. The outer wing flaps were subjected to extensive fatigue tests. As weaknesses were observed, designs were improved until the flaps successfully completed 8,000 cycles. When tests began on wing down bending, it was necessary to use stop motion photography to speed up the slow bending of the wing. The jumpy movements of the workers were caused by this camera technique. The slowly bending wing withstood ultimate load for three minutes without failure in the test for dynamic taxi, 
a condition critical for the outer wing panel. It also withstood ultimate load during the test on wing down bending and main gear load, a condition critical for the wing and main gear combination. A number of other tests were performed in an effort to improve the design of the C-130. Among these were the lateral gusts on the aft fuselage, including simulated airdrop, that is, with the cargo door open. The J-2 door test, the tail down spring back test, and the test on the cam followers on the flaps. When the examinations disclosed any weaknesses, improvements were made until the parts were satisfactory. Separate tests were conducted on many vital parts of the C-130. For instance, the hydraulic reservoir was filled to capacity with fluid and slashed and vibrated simultaneously for 25 hours, simulating the most severe operating conditions. There was no leakage. During the year, special tests were made on a new cargo floor design. The new floor was constructed of extruded stiffeners riveted to a metal skin, which could be used to replace the solid machine stiffened panels in event of need for wartime acceleration of the C-130 program. The rolling test consisted of a rubber tire under a load of 6,500 pounds, rolling back and forth across the floor 2,000 times. Operation of the main landing gear was observed under extreme temperature and environmental conditions and was also subjected to sand, frozen mud, and salt spray. Temperatures range from minus 65 to plus 160 degrees Fahrenheit. This tandem landing gear is designed to enable the plane to operate safely from semi-prepared landing fields. While the static test article was undergoing many rigorous qualification tests, other C-130s completed production airplanes were used for flight tests, demonstrations, and briefings for key military personnel. The first show was staged in July. Military personnel, newspaper reporters, photographers, and top television and radio people from all over the nation came to Marietta to see the new air freighter. The demonstration began with an exhibition of the flying characteristics of the Hercules. The turboprop C-130 is the fastest transport plane in production for the U.S. Air Force. It can travel at speeds of more than 370 miles per hour. A fast climbing aircraft, the C-130 can reach an altitude of 2,500 feet in only 60 seconds. A versatile plane, the C-130 can fly with the stratojets at 40,000 feet altitude on long missions, or it can dip low enough to drop paratroops and supplies to advance military base operations. The reporters, television, and radio men watched the Hercules back up over great distances. The unique ability to travel such distances in reverse makes the plane particularly useful in combat zones where time and space are limiting factors. The steerable nose wheel and the reversible propellers allow the aircraft to park in a very limited area. The writers and military personnel saw a display of the loading capabilities of the cargo transport. Men from the 18th Air Force, Donaldson Air Base, South Carolina, staged the demonstration. A 5,000-gallon jet fuel tanker was driven into the aircraft using the built-in loading ramp, which serves as a rear door. This ramp also can be put at truck floor level for straight-in loading. The plane can accommodate 20 tons of heavy equipment. The changeover from cargo to personnel transport can be accomplished in a matter of minutes. 92 troops marched into the airplane during the demonstration. The C-130 can make either aerial or ground deliveries of men and cargo. In November, the C-130 presented a demonstration of loading general cargo at Dover, Delaware for the Military Air Transport Service. A training program was inaugurated to prepare men to become crew members of this prop jet plane. Spare parts shipments to the Air Force commands, which are to receive the C-130s, were ahead of schedule. The Air Force decided to change from Curtis Wright propellers to Aero Products propellers. Aero props were installed on engine number three of the sixth airplane, and tests were begun late in the year.
The cargo transport is to be used as a supply ship in the Arctic regions. Development design was started on a ski wheel for the C-130. The ski wheels were scheduled to be flight tested late in 1956. In preparation for flights into snowlands, the tail of the C-130 was painted red, the standard Arctic marking. The color makes the aircraft visible against a background of snow-covered or even desert terrain. The testing and production programs were on schedule at the end of the year. Twelve C-130s had been completed. Some were at least to the Air Force for testing. Airplane number 3018 was starting on production line. Climatic, Aerial delivery, desert, wind tunnel, and Arctic tests were scheduled for the next year. A highlight of the year came when the Hercules made its first extended flight, flying from Marietta to Philadelphia for the National Air Show. By late 1956, the new versatile cargo transport was scheduled to take its place as an operational unit of the United States Air Force. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.